Four years ago, on March 11th, the World Health Organization declared a pandemic, reshaping our day-to-day -day life and reminding us of the interconnected fragility of the world that we live in. Tonight, we're going to take a look back at how far we've come and unpack some of the mysteries that the virus presented at the forefront that we now have answers to. Plus, just weeks away from the kickoff of spring, we're learning more about whether COVID-19 is becoming a seasonal virus or something that we're going to have to fend off all year round. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us tonight, as always, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, world-renowned doctor and chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And later on, we have Dr. Jesse Bell joining us, who serves as the Claire M. B. Hubbard Professor of Water, Climate and Health at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Dr. Gold, thanks so much for joining us. It's a very important evening for us to look back on. Where would you like to begin tonight? Well, absolutely, Christina, and thanks to you. And of course, thanks to our audience for joining us this evening. It is hard to believe it's been four full years since the World Health Organization declared this to be a pandemic. And, you know, I reflect on what it was like back uh, in 2020 uh, at this time of the year. Uh, when people were really questioning uh, of what this, quote, novel coronavirus really could be. There were all kinds of predictions and projections and studies done, uh, everything from saying this was going to turn into be uh, a lot of nothing to this was going to be a tragic and devastating uh, pandemic. And uh, clearly, uh, it's been some of both. But uh, there's no question that these four years have taught us a lot. We have benefited from it. But at the same time, it's been a time of an incredible tragedy. And so my uh, remarks tonight uh, briefly are going to be to give us an update on where we are with COVID. Uh, and fortunately, a lot of the news remains to be good news with falling numbers. And we'll get into the metrics in just a minute. And then I want to talk about another important pandemic, which is an emotional health pandemic and healthcare workers, which is dramatically impacting the overall access to health care in the United States and largely around the world. So let's look at the first graphic together and see what our numbers look like for hospitalization. And again, <clears throat> down again since last week, 4,774 daily hospitalizations, uh, 1.4 per 100,000. If you look at the map, you can see there are uh, small sites of bright red, orange, or amber. But for the most part, the country looks at extremely low levels. Indeed, uh, Delaware, some of the highest counts per 100,000. But again, very small numbers, 81 hospitalizations. Uh, Pennsylvania, 365. So to your point, Christina, it is still with us, uh, although fewer hospitalizations, fewer deaths, and fewer severe illnesses, as we've learned more and more about the early diagnosis and treatment. If you look at the trends for total hospitalization by week in the United States total, again, falling numbers, no question, since the peak we saw following the winter holidays, hopefully this will be sustained. Uh, I can tell you, having attended some meetings in the Orlando area over the weekend, there were no shortage of human beings on spring break in that part of the world and that part of our nation. And so we'll see whether that has anything to do with uh, an uptick in the numbers uh, over uh, the next several weeks. When we look at the data by age, uh, it looks like, uh, although the total number of uh, hospitalizations continues to fall, the 70 and older group, it clearly has plateaued. And interesting, it's even plateaued in the 60 to 69 uh, age group. So the fall off that we're seeing is actually uh, in the younger age group uh, as opposed to in the older age group, down 7% over the last uh, 14 uh, days. When we look at the type of virus uh, that we're seeing, uh, it still is predominantly the JN1 strain, but this JN1.13 and the 1.18 now comprise over 5%. And when we look at that 5%, it is not evenly distributed over the United States. Uh, if you see the uh, orangish sort of color uh, in the mid-Atlantic uh, part of the United States, it's clear that this is propagating 
from that part of the country spreading, and uh, it's almost certain that we'll see more of it in the Great Lakes region, in the southeast, and then it's going to work its way across uh, the United States as it does appear to be uh, transmissible. If we uh, look further now at some of our wastewater data, again, we have reporting uh, sites uh, just under 1,300. Uh, uh, the highest numbers, the 80 to 100 percent, are down 21 percent over the last seven days. Even the 60 to 79 percent are down 12 percent. Uh, and so, again, even though there are hot spots, and you can see them uh, indicated by the bright red and the amber on the U.S. map, uh, the majority of the wastewater reporting sites uh, are now showing uh, a continued fall off in the amount of uh, COVID uh, viral particles uh, in the wastewater. So while it's uh, not over, uh, the predictions for infection based upon wastewater do appear to be favorable. As a matter of fact, if we look at the overall U.S. wastewater trends, uh, in this chart clearly shows uh, that the total number of viral particles uh, being identified, known as the wastewater viral activity level, uh, has fallen from immediately after the uh, winter holidays from approximately 1,200 uh, down to approximately 4,000. So a tremendous fall off in wastewater viral particles, which I interpret as one of the best signs because it's not dependent upon people reporting illness or even accurate hospitalizations uh, or even deaths. However, uh, if we look at the case fatality rates, uh, we can see that following the uh, post-holiday peak, uh, they have continued to fall off. Again, uh, very simply, the wastewater numbers fall, the case numbers fall, the hospitalization rates of severe illness fall, and then the death rates fall uh, as well. If you look at the aggregated number of deaths, again, it looks like we're pretty plateaued, uh, and uh, that's good news. The bad news is uh, we're still well over a million, almost at 1.2 million American deaths by week uh, in our nation. Uh, finally, in this part of my remarks, uh, if we look at the overall rates of death uh, per uh, 100,000 uh, weekly COVID deaths in the United States, uh, 2,400. You know, I'll say that again, even though we're celebrating falling viral counts in the wastewater and fewer hospitalizations and fewer deaths, there are still 2,400 Americans who are confirmed to have died uh, in our country. That's a death rate of 0.7 per 100,000. It is a tiny, tiny fraction of where we were a year ago and two years ago, but that's still 2,400 that are not going to celebrate uh, the the spring holidays with us that are not going to be here for Memorial Day or July 4th. And our, you know, kids, grandparents and uh, siblings and, and others are going to be greatly missed. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, my family as well as many others feel that uh, acutely. If we look at the overall uh, death rates from all the viral pneumonias, uh, again, this would include influenza, COVID, RSV, uh, and everything else, uh, we're in the beginning of a plateau phase. And as the weather warms, hopefully these numbers will continue to fall uh, and get us back to our uh, baseline counts that we typically see in the summer, where these case fatality rates uh, usually go down uh, extremely low. It'll be interesting to see a month from now uh, where we are uh, and answering your question, Christina, whether we're going to be dealing with this forever at these levels or whether we're going to see the seasonality that many have uh, anticipated. So I'd like to uh, just provide a couple of updates on COVID uh, and before I talk about uh, another very important type of pandemic. Uh, this is just a recent article saying that low iron levels resulting from infection are associated with long COVID. And uh, well, this is a really important concept, and that is that they've identified, this was a really small study, but they've identified that 3 in 10 people infected uh, with COVID could go on to develop long COVID symptoms. And this is now frequently connected 
to the prevalence of low iron levels. So it's not clear whether the low iron levels uh, are the cause or related to the cause of long COVID or whether they're a consequence. But it is estimated, <clears throat> this is a study from the United Kingdom, Great Britain, uh, that 1.9 million people right now in the UK are experiencing self-reported uh, long COVID. And so this is not a trivial finding. And the good news is about low iron levels that this is really treatable once the cause is identified. There are many different causes. Some of it's dietary, some of it's absorption, some of it's related to cofactors that retain iron. But iron is obviously critical for our red blood cells to carry oxygen. And so if there's a connection here that can be solidly identified, this could be really good news as to how we could treat some of the brain fog, memory loss, and so many other things that are associated with long COVID. Uh, this is another study uh, that looks at the effects of long COVID uh, on uh, cognitive function, our, our ability to think and to rationalize. And this is a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a rather prestigious U.S. medical journal, and found that uh, among participants who had recovered from COVID symptoms, that there was a significant cognitive deficit. That is to say their IQ fell several points. And for those that went on to develop long COVID that lasted 12 weeks or more, uh, that was, it was, it was twice the fall off in intelligent quota. Now, it's unclear how much or how little of that ever recovers, but we all know that people that have had long COVID, particularly for a long period of time, sometimes still maintain their memory loss, their loss of uh, cognitive function. Uh, sometimes some of their other higher integrative functions fall off. And it's not surprising to see this change. It would be very interesting, though, and very important to see how much of that actually recovers uh, once the long COVID uh, interval has, uh, has passed. Another recent article published in uh, the Annals of Internal Medicine just this week looked at the relationship of COVID-19 to the increased risk for rheumatic disease. And by that, I mean things such as a systemic lupus, erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis, and many others. And this was a study uh, in South Korea and Japan that found a very significant correlation. Uh, the absolute rates of uh, covid uh, in this particular instance, were 1.15% uh, in Korea, South Korea, and 3.87% uh, in Japan. Again, uh, not quite cause and effect, but may give us some indications as to how we can prevent these long COVID consequences, because these are two diseases that we know pretty well, understand the treatment of, and perhaps uh, there's even an opportunity for prevention and, frankly, better understanding rheumatoid arthritis and lupus as a result of seeing this correlation with the inflammatory rheumatic process associated uh, with COVID. Uh, and then the last of these studies that I wanted to point out uh, that was recently, I would put in the category of good news, is that we've been talking about on this broadcast uh, for several years now that there is an incidence of kidney injury in what's known as uh, AKI or acute kidney injury that's associated with COVID. It's frequently associated with severe cases, hospitalization, and some of the other consequences of severe COVID. But this study showed that uh, of those acute kidney injuries that occurred as a result of having COVID-19, that there's a 33% lower risk of long-term major kidney events, including death, decreased kidney function, need for dialysis, transplantation, uh, et cetera. And when compared to other illnesses, such as the common flu, uh, that COVID patients fared better by a full third uh, than other types of kidney uh, failure that is associated uh, with uh, these infections. And this was a study of almost 10,000 people that were hospitalized uh, between March of 2020 and June of 2022 and reported again in the Journal of the American Medical Association publications. So again, it's somewhat optimistic, but also gives us some insight into the differences of the cause of kidney failure uh, as it relates to uh, having an uh, infection with a severe illness such as COVID.
So I want to shift gears briefly and talk about another pandemic that has occurred across the world. And this has to do with the uh, burnout that has occurred and the loss of healthcare professionals uh, as a direct result of, uh, of COVID. Now, uh, we have talked extensively on this broadcast about the fact that uh, the COVID pandemic itself is not the only cause of burnout, early retirement, uh, and so many other adverse consequences on the healthcare workforce. The nurses, pharmacists, technicians, physicians, social workers, and so many others that care for our family members, that care for you and I in inpatient settings, outpatient settings, telehealth settings, uh, et cetera. But this was called out uh, and today is a particularly notable day because not only is today uh, notable for the four-year anniversary of the World Health Organization identifying COVID as a pandemic, but today happens to be Healthcare Workforce Wellbeing Day. And that was passed into law in the 117th Congress uh, in 2022, known as the Dr. Laura Bream Act. And Dr. Bream was a healthcare professional in New York City who was dealing with patients uh, in the early days of the COVID pandemic, became distracted, distraught, was challenged by this, and ultimately died by suicide. And her family and her colleagues, uh, not just in the city that she worked and in the institutions in which she trained, uh, but across the nation, worked together to make this a cause celeb and to focus the activities of the United States Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, the National Academy of Medicine, led by Dr. Victor Zhao, into programs that were going to specifically identify the causes and create a toolkit uh, that could be useful to stop this burnout and to understand what can be done to add joy back to the delivery of health care and to reduce some of the stress, the moral injury, the depression, the suicidality uh, that is associated with it. So I'm really pleased to tell you that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, just recently launched their first federal campaign for hospitals to tackle healthcare workforce. And they've broken this study uh, into four different critical areas. <clears throat> the first is the workplace, physical environment, and the safety climate. That is to say, just like any other workforce, people have to feel when they're delivering health care that they're in a safe environment. The, pol the policies and the culture, the evaluation and the experience, and that their overall health status, mental health uh, and physical health as well. And so this is a major, major piece of work that is actively ongoing, part and parcel of the Dr. Laura Bream Act. And then at the same time, and actually going back to 2017, the National Academy of Medicine <coughs> created the so-called Change Maker Campaign for Healthcare Workforce Wellbeing. And I was very honored to have served uh, on a leadership team many of one of the many leadership teams with the National Academy who published this work uh, less than a year ago identifying seven priority areas for healthcare well-being. The first being a positive work and learning environment, the second being measurement assessment strategies and research, the third being destigmatizing mental health, uh, the fourth being compliance, regulatory, and policy barriers. The fifth being effective technology tools, i.e., to take people out of being a scribe into being a healthcare professional. The sixth, uh, well being as a long term value. And the seventh, having an inclusive and welcoming workforce. The sixth area, though, is one that I am particularly interested in, and I just to quote to you. Uh, from Dr. Thomas Nasca, the President and the Chief Executive of the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education and a close personal friend. He writes here, to spark a national movement to support healthcare worker well-being, we must start 
from a deep commitment to well-being, not as a short-term, but as a long-term value. We cannot make meaningful change to our health care system without this foundation of health organizations of all settings forming a network built upon this shared uh, embedded value. And so today on this celebratory day, but also on a very sober day, I remind our audience that workforce shortages are widely present across both rural and urban America, significant medical deserts uh, in almost every specialty that you can imagine, including behavioral health, largely due to early retirement and burnout, somewhat due to the pandemic, accelerated by the pandemic, but so many other factors. And this results, of course, in critical delays in access for diagnostic testing, routine physician evaluations, procedures, uh, et cetera. And I see that widely across our state and across the nation. And so my message to uh, our audience tonight, Christina, is that uh, they need to be aware of the specific workforce needs in your community, in your clinics, in your rehabilitation centers, diagnostic labs, et cetera. And then always, when you have an opportunity, as I try to do, extend thanks and show grace to those people who provide health care uh, to you and to those that you care about. And as always, uh, when in doubt, wash, rinse, and repeat. So with that, I very much look forward to our audience questions and comments tonight. I'm sure many members of our audience have seen delays in access to care, to diagnostic testing, uh, to procedures as a result of workforce shortages. And we'd like to hear from them. We'd like to hear from all of you about your experiences. And then, of course, uh, the unique opportunity uh, that we have tonight to reintroduce uh, our, one of our previous guests, Dr. Jesse Bell, uh, back into our audience and to our discussions. We have a lot to cover tonight. 877-731-6733 is the number to call if you want to share your experience, just as Dr. Gold talked about moments ago. And Dr. Gold, what I loved about what you just mentioned is that just extending grace, extending gratitude, saying thank you, it can go so far. You never know when somebody may have reached their final wit or maybe they're ready to throw in the towel. Just a simple reminder that they're appreciated, the work that they do, they're grateful for it can go so far. So thank you for that. We have a lot to talk about. Before we bring the audience in, I do want to find out what's happening with measles because we're hearing more and more about this in the mainstream media. Can you give us an update there, Dr. Gold? Uh, would you repeat the question, uh, Christina? You've got it just a little bit muffled for me. Oh, okay. Um, I was talking about measles. We're seeing more headlines, especially out of the state of Florida, about measles outbreaks. Are you hearing anything? Yes. Uh, yeah, can you update our audience on that if you can, please? Yes, uh, you know, we talked a good deal about that last week, of course, and the answer to your question uh, is that there are other sites across the country that are now starting to report small measles uh, outbreaks, uh, but uh, most of them are still related to travel experiences from other parts of the world. The area in Florida that we were talking about last week was an area where there were no travel-related uh, incidents uh, in a K-12 school system. There are several other areas uh, in the U.S., but we have not seen a uh, what I would call an exponential transmission uh, of measles. That's something we might ask Dr. Bell about as well. I actually just checked the numbers last night thinking that we might get an audience question about that today and there's nothing that uh, represents the fact that we need to be even more alarmed than we were but I would still recommend to our audience that if you have kiddos uh, that are school age eligible uh, they need to get fully vaxxed with uh, the typical uh, MMR uh, sequence. Okay, thank you so much for that. We're going to pause for a quick break, but it's your turn to join the conversation. We'd love to hear from you tonight. The number is 877-731-6733. And here is a topic that everybody can chime in on tonight. We're talking about the relationship between climate and health, human health and climate, the interrelationship. That's next. Stay with us. You're watching Rural Health Matters only on RFD-TV. 
It's raining. It's pouring. During bad weather, driving can become downright dangerous. So the next time a storm is coming, trust Battle Vision Storm. The revolutionary glare reduction glasses that turn your sight bright during bad weather at night or during the day. Watch your ordinary vision become extraordinary. Wow, it's so it's so clear. It's dusk, but I can really see. Oh, wow. Honestly, for how dark it is out here right now, these are incredible. Battle Vision Storm uses light-optimizing lenses that block blue rays, so you see clearly in heavy rain at night or blinding snow during the day. Heavy rain, snow, sleet, or fog can make it impossible to drive. Not with Battle Vision Storm. And they're not just for storms. They turn night to bright, even in perfect weather. I used to hate driving at night. The traffic lines were hard to see. The lights from oncoming traffic were blinding. I feel so much safer driving in the evenings now. Blinding sunlight or headlights cut the glare instantly. Dark traffic signs? See them with confidence. Blurry lane markers? Turn clear and visible. Wow! Even objects in your side and rear view mirrors are easier to see. And Battle Vision Storm go head to head with the toughest conditions. Whether you're driving through smoke filled air from wildfires, or you're on a boat getting crushed by the sea, and they're guaranteed for life. Get your Battle Vision Storm for only $19.99. But wait, due to rising costs and supply chain shortages, this may be your last chance to get your very own Battle Vision Storm at this low price. There is a strict limit of four Battle Vision Storm per order while supplies last. Don't wait, order now. Call 1 800 514 8411. That's 1 800 514 8411. Or visit BattleVisionStorm.com. So call 1 800 514 8411 now. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. We're glad that you're with us. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome a fan favorite back and a very important topic to discuss. I think everybody's going to be interested in this one tonight. Dr. Bell is the Claire M. Hubbard Professor of Water, Climate, and Health at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. His research explores the relationships of extreme weather, climate, variability in the climate change overall impact on natural and human processes. He is a very well-researched man. I know you look very young, Dr. Bell, but I've had a chance to read some of your scholarly articles and you're brilliant, sir. Your goal is to work and find linkages between climate and health so that we can better prepare our communities for climate and weather-related disasters. So the work you do is incredibly important. It impacts all of us. Welcome back. Let's type right into your knowledge base right off the bat tonight because it's a rare opportunity to have an expert like you. Are we actually seeing more extreme weather events right now? Do the statistics bear that out? Or do we just have more access to global news happening here and everywhere more so than ever before? Well, thank you. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, yes, I can give a short answer. Yes, we do see that the statistics do bear out, that we have seen an increase in extreme weather and climate-related events, uh, especially over the last 50 to 100 years. Um, we obviously, we have more reporting around some of this, but because it is so frequent, we're probably actually missing a lot of the events that are occurring. And the reason that we're able to, to know about all this change that we're experiencing across the United States and across the earth is the amount of information that we're gathering around the earth. Uh, we have a number of earth observations, everything from satellite data to ground-based observations, we're monitoring the oceans, and especially here in the United States, we have a real abundance of really good quality data. And through that, we've been able to see a very definite pattern where we're seeing an increase in the extreme climate and weather-related events. So they're becoming more frequent and more intense. And um, you know, one of the reasons for that is we're seeing a change in our climate system. We're seeing things becoming warmer. We're seeing changes in precipitation patterns, and all of that is impacting our weather and our climate today. And so what we're experiencing today is different than what we were experiencing 50 years ago. When we're able to see these patterns, we're able to understand these changes, and those changes have impacts on us and impacts on society. 
and, and more society to go around as population continues to boom all across the globe. Now, we all remember Smokey Bear. Smokey is actually 80 years old. Smokey is now an octogenarian. So he's been working hard for 80 years now. But when you look at the last, I'd say, five to 10 years, Dr. Gold, we can all get behind that. Wildfires. They seem to be more prevalent. He's been working harder these days. And in parts of the country like California, Washington, Oregon, the entire western half of the country, we have seen these huge blazes break out. Is this becoming more problematic as well? Is this something that you're able to quantify and gauge over time? Most definitely. Um, similar to what we're seeing with the change in our climate system and changes in extreme weather and climate events, that is having these other impacts on our environment. And for example, wildfires. You know, we're seeing increase in temperature. We're seeing conditions getting drier in certain parts of the United States, especially in the western part of the U.S. And so with higher temperatures, we're seeing a lengthening of the wildfire season. In some places, we've actually seen almost two months increase in the wildfire season since the 1970s. That's two more months where we can see wildfires actually take place. And because temperatures are higher and precipitation patterns have been changing with uh, temperatures or with precipitation becoming drier in certain parts of the US, that are, those are ideal conditions for wildfires to occur. Not only that, we're also, there's been a change in management practices around wildfires. For a long time, we were suppressing wildfires. And with that, through that suppression of wildfires, there was a buildup of debris, plant debris, dead vegetative material. And so it was a perfect condition as things get drier, warmer, lengthening of the season that can lead to these more intense wildfire events. Yeah, it's tough because um, it's hard to gauge wildfire management and, and the role that that actually plays. Now, what's interesting is I study weather for a living as a meteorologist, and so I, I'm studying the short term. You're studying climate predominantly. I'm sure weather as well goes right hand in hand with climate. But what I can tell you is just being in California, there were so many dry years, year after year after year. We saw five consecutive years of drought. And then we were inundated with rainfall. And then the following summer, we didn't have a lot of wildfires. And that was last summer. Going into this coming summer, same thing. We've been inundated with weather across the West Coast. I'm forecasting the same, at least for the start of wildfire season, that it's going to be slow because we've had so much precipitation. How do you factor in all of the weather events when you're thinking about climate and the long run? Yeah, you know, that's such a great question. You know, climate is so, um, so consistent. V weather is really variable. And so weather changes very dramatically from one day to the next, from even one hour to the next, especially here in Nebraska. But when you look at climate, climate is the accumulation of what happens over longer periods of time. So seasons are climate. Um, year by year is climate. Geographic variability, that is climate. And so it is really that statistical average of the weather. And so when we're looking at changes in um, precipitation patterns, changes in temperature, we're, we're trying to look at this over the longer term. You can look at any individual day and say here in Nebraska, there could be a day in February and it just happens to be uh, warmer than a day in July, but that doesn't mean that our Februarys are warmer than one day or than the entire season of July or the entire summer season. And so we don't want to look at that slight variability. We want to look at those longer patterns over time to really understand what is that climate variability. And that's where we're getting at when we're looking at you know the wildfire season extending or changes in extreme climate and weather related events. We're not looking at the individual event we're really interested in what is that long-term change that we're seeing. And then also understanding how that's impacting society and how that's impacting us as, as individuals as well, and our health. You know, it's fascinating. Dr. Gold brought up a really great point uh, just a couple weeks ago back on, uh, what was it? I'd say at the beginning of last month, talking about mosquitoes, how going into this upcoming season, we are expecting more mosquito-borne illness because it's going to be warmer, more standing water will attract more mosquitoes, and then that could be problematic. Uh, what are you hearing about that? Any sort of forecast you can give us there? Yeah, you know, it, it's really variable, and mosquitoes are such an interesting uh, organism, and the way that they interact with climate. 
It's actually one of the earliest relationships that we found with climate and weather. If you look back, one of the reasons that we have such good climate measurements in the United States is because the military wanted better understanding of how temp changes in temperature and precipitation were related to uh, diseases and outbreaks of disease in military populations. And this is back in the early 1800s. And the reason that they did that was um, at the time they'd understand mosquitoes transmitted virus viruses such as malaria and yellow fever. But what they could understand was as temperatures got warmer and as precipitation patterns changed, they would see outbreaks of disease. And because of that, that's one of the reasons we have such a good long-term uh, observations on precipitation and temperature. But when you look at things like West Nile virus, um, which is spread by mosquitoes, and we have uh, very much in abundance here in the central part of the United States, in Nebraska, where I'm at, there has been historical relationships shown that during periods of dry and drought, we actually see uh, more cases of West Nile. Now, however, in other parts of the United States, they actually show different relationships. And that just gets at some of the complexity between mosquitoes, the environment, and our health, and how we need to understand some of this complexity from one region to the next, because the relationships that we see in, like for example, Nebraska, might not be the same as Tennessee, which might not be the same as California. And so moving forward, um, yeah, we, we need to pay attention to it and definitely pay attention to some of those relationships on a local level and on a regional level as well. Yeah, fleas, ticks, uh, a lot of the things that farmers and ranchers have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. We seem to see these swings in extreme weather, 100-year floods, followed by 100-year drought events just a few years later. For those who might not be as familiar with weather or the way that weather works, can you explain why don't the 100-year floods keep the ground moist to prevent droughts and fires? Talk about just how quickly that evaporation process takes place. Of course, it depends on where you are, but, but explain that, if you will. Sure, yeah, that is such a complex relationship between the two. And, and we're seeing more of those types of patterns as well. Um, it was less than 10 years ago, or maybe around 10 years ago, that the Mississippi Re River within you know, one to two years saw the lowest recorded um, flow rates, river flow rates, and the highest, uh, like I said, within the, that two year period. And so we're seeing more of these types of extreme events, either on one end of the spectrum or the other end of the spectrum, which then has dramatic impacts on society, on our health. And one of the things that we think about when we see these very intense precipitation events followed by drought or vice versa, there are a number of different factors that are interplaying there. Um, when we have more precipitation falling in a given period of time, especially if it follows a drought event, a lot of that, and depending on soil conditions, a lot of that is lost as runoff. And so it isn't even absorbed within the soil. And then on the other end, you know, it really depends on vegetation and how much uh, moisture is absorbed. And then all of a sudden you see uh, more plant growth and you see uh, higher rates of transpiration or water lost into the atmosphere due to, um, due to those higher temperatures. And so when one follows the other, when we see a drought event following a, a heavy precipitation event, that can have dramatic impacts on society, on the amount of water that's uh, moving through the system and causing drier conditions that can happen very quickly. Yeah, you know, you talk about the drought conditions in California that can have a huge impact on our farmers. All of our Western farmers know what it's like to deal with drought conditions if they irrigate. It's very interesting to see how a lot of that storage capacity that they have could be improved and so that they could easily capture more of that runoff. You're able to actually assess these sorts of things. You're a co-author on the nation's first comprehensive assessment of drought and health titled Drought and Public Health. We need water, not just to drink, also to grow our crops. And talk about this roadmap for advancing engagement and preparedness, what did you find and what does that roadmap look like? Yeah, that was a really unique opportunity. We were working with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It got kicked off by working with uh, CDC and different federal agencies. Then uh, from there, we did workshops across the United States to understand um, what local and state health departments and emergency managers were facing in the context of drought. 
And then we synthesized all that to create this roadmap. Um, you know, this all started too, when we first started looking at the impacts of drought on society, on the United States, uh, we realized that there wasn't a lot of work going on. Internationally, we understood that droughts likely result in more deaths than any other climate or weather related disaster. And that's primarily due to famine and malnutrition. But here in the United States, we really didn't see drought as a major human health threat, but we faced multiple major drought events across the US on, a, on almost a yearly basis. And so one of the things that we wanted to do is look at this more in depth. And the reason we even got started in that realm was because with some of these major droughts in California or other parts of the United States, when they had been talking about drought, they were talking about it in the context of water resource management in the context of agriculture. But they were starting to get reports back from some of these states that was saying, you know, this is starting to impact the health of our people, uh, the environment that we live in, and we wanna better understand what's going on. And so that was the reason that this roadmap even came into to play and why we even started working on it. And through all that information that we were able to gain from local public health departments, from people working the, on this on the ground, uh, one of the big things that we really saw is that there was a lot of lack of information to be able to relay how drought can potentially impact human health. And so that's where we started to develop more of a broader assessment on for the federal agencies on how they can potentially better engage around uh, drought and the impacts it has on health. We also got to hear from uh, those local and state health departments so that they could give us feedback on things that they felt like they were missing. And from that, you know, we divided the roadmap, we provided a number of opportunities for individuals uh, to understand how these things are related. And one of the biggest things that came out of it was we need more community around this. We need to better understand how drought is impacting human health in the United States. We also need to make sure that we're working with our healthcare public health officials to make sure that we have the best information going to them as these drought events occur. Because one of the things that we kind of forget when we talk about drought is drought is a threat multiplier. Drought is associated with more extreme temperature events and drought is a, associated with changes in water quality and water availability, which can impact human health. Changes in air quality due to things like dust storms and wildfires. And it's also related back to changes in vector habitat, like we were talking about with West Nile virus. And so understanding all these relationships so that we can better educate and inform the public health officials and healthcare officials that we're working with across the country. Okay, we're gonna pause for a quick break. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. We wanna hear from you tonight. Stay with us. More Rural Health Matters right after this. Looking forward to your call. We'll be right back. One of the biggest challenges my clients face is buying and selling a home at the same time. Many of my clients ask me, Tanya, how can I afford to buy my next home, but also make sure my current home sells? That's why who you work with matters. With Homelight, we're able to help our clients buy and sell at the same time. It's the most game-changing product in real estate today. Together with Homelight, we've helped clients win the home of their dreams. San Angelo loves rodeo as much as any town that I have ever seen. They know the players, they know the horses, they know who they want to cheer for. And they know this, they might be the smallest town in the Texas swing, but they're probably going to be the most dedicated, loyal, and maybe even the loudest. All those folks that are stacked inside that arena, they are rodeo fans and they know exactly what they're there to see and they're there to cheer on some of the best and they know what a good rodeo is in San Angelo. I think it's really cool how they spread that rodeo out over the weekends. So they absolutely just pack the stands and they have a big light show at the beginning. It's a, it's a really fun rodeo and San Angelo absolutely loves rodeo. I have always said that San Angelo is rodeo meets rock concert. They've got lasers, they've got loud music. It is exciting from top to bottom and definitely one that you wanna catch, whether it's in person, it's a hard ticket to get, or right here on the Cowboy Channel, San Angelo Stock Show and Rodeo is definitely one that you don't wanna miss out on. 
Need to get your car protected and looking great for the harsh winter season? Cerakote's best-selling line of automotive care products can transform your vehicles quickly, easily, and affordably. Our number one selling headlight kit restores cloudy headlights back to like new and keeps them that way, guaranteed. Restore that faded trim in just one wipe with our easy-to-apply trim coat kit. Achieve unsurpassed gloss, shine, and slickness with our rapid ceramic paint sealing. Buy any of Cerakote's number one selling ceramic products for under $20 at these leading retailers today. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Glad you're with us. We're going to get in as many calls as we can. 877-731-6733. First up is Randy of Kentucky. Thanks for joining us, Randy. Go right ahead. Yes, I was wanting to ask if you all heard of the Hunga Tonga Hunga volcanic eruption um, that happened in January of 22. According to NASA, it was the largest in recorded history. And it was like I say, it was underwater. The reason that was so important or different is because it puts so much vapor in the air, and that causes global warming. Vapor, and they said that it would raise the the temperature of the Earth uh, at least a half a degree. Uh, and I didn't know if you'd heard about that. I'd like to see if you're. They probably changed a lot of stuff on the NASA website about it. or been forced to. And also, are you saying this is man-made? global change or are you saying that uh, this is natural global change i'm happy well, to start that. randy just by saying thanks for calling before i turn it over to uh, dr bell but those are critical questions and i've read about that same underwater volcanic eruptions as well uh, causing climate change so uh, this would be uh, two really good areas for dr bell to comment on yeah, th those are excellent questions. Um, you know, I, I don't know uh, that much about that specific question about the um, the volcano that was erupting. I do know, you know, one of the things with volcanic eruptions is a lot of times they put up um, particulate matter in the atmosphere, and that particulate matter can actually uh, block out the sunlight. And we've been able to account for a lot of the volcanic activity and, and different activity um, and changes in our climate system associated with natural occurring types of events. When we're talking about what are the potential impacts of climate and the climate that we're experiencing now and how that is changing, um, a lot of that is human caused. Uh, we've understood that relationship for a pretty long time. Uh, you can actually go back the last couple hundred years, and we understood the relationship between gases in our atmosphere and how it impacts our Earth's climate. And it was actually about a hundred years, over a hundred years ago, uh, there was a Swedish scientist named Arrhenius, and he was actually able, he was in Northern Europe, and he was looking at um, all the coal burning uh, stacks in, in Northern Europe and seeing that billowing up into the atmosphere, the smoke billowing up in the atmosphere. And he realized that that was carbon dioxide. And one of the things that he realized was, he's like, okay, I understand the physics behind this. And so around the turn of the century in 1900, he ran calculations and estimated that with more CO2 in our atmosphere, we should see an increase in temperature. Well, you move forward, now we're actually able to measure what's going on in our atmosphere and we're able to measure where that's coming from. And so we realized that a lot of that change similar to what Arrhenius, uh, the Swedish scientist, was able to estimate over 100 years ago, is that it's coming from uh, burning of fossil fuels. And then that has a direct relationship on our temperature, which then has repercussions on our extreme weather events and uh, climate system as a whole. And so we're able to understand a lot of these relationships and, and draw it back to a lot of the changes that we're seeing in our weather and our climate and especially over time, it has been related to human causes. Okay, 877-731-6733. That leaves a line open for you. We're going back to the phones where Russ joins us tonight from New York. Thanks for joining us, Russ. Go right ahead. Well, thanks, Christina. Now that I know you have a background in meteorology, I I'm going to follow up with your expertise later. But I would like to ask Dr. Bell if he knows of cloud seeding has an effect on drought here and climate change here in the United States? Because I know that China is using cloud seeding where they put silver iodide in the cloud to rearrange 
the weather and make the Gobi Desert into a green place. And, you know, without sounding more paranoid than usual, I, I wonder if maybe this is kind of a soft power warfare against the U.S. by changing things over here. And I'll listen to your answer. Thank you, Doctor. Jesse? Sure. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I really can't speak too much about, uh, because I don't know enough, about the impacts that cloud seeding could potentially have on our climate systems here. Um, one of the things that always makes me a little bit nervous about any time that we do any of this geoengineering where you're changing uh, the Earth's climate in one area, it can have a ripple effect across the Earth's climate in other places as well. And so I always proceed with caution around some of those types of issues because, you know, our Earth system, it's not a large experiment that we want to play with too much because it could have ripple effects in other places. Um, there has been cloud seeding in China. There's also been discussions on geoengineering in other parts of the world, looking at our atmosphere. And uh, to this point, I just don't know what the potential ramifications are across the globe. And so with any of that, I always say we should proceed with a lot of caution and be very careful about what the impacts could be yeah. nationally and internationally as well. Thank you for that. And call. continue to study it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and that's where it gets a little bit tricky because uh, we are making big strides in this country. We acknowledge that, that this is happening and we're trying to reduce our CO2 emissions. But we make up 4.5% of the world's overall population. And you look at China, you look at India, closer to 18% in both countries. And they're not trying to implement carbon sequestration like we are here. So I will ask you this, Dr. Bell. Is it enough for us to continue to make these huge strides if we can't get the rest of the world to play along? Yeah, you know, it, it, we are, you know, one of the, we are the largest economy in the world. So it is important for us to make sure that we're doing the efforts that are necessary to take a lot of, uh, to move a lot of this forward. It's also important for us to make sure that we're working internationally to try to address these issues as well. Um, and I would also say, and this is a big part of what I work on, is even if we do the things that are necessary to reduce the impacts of climate change, either in the United States or internationally, we still need to be thinking about resilience. And how do we have more resilient um, communities and uh, more resilient systems to the impacts of climate change? Because we are in a changed climate. The climate that we're experiencing today, like I mentioned before, is different than the climate that we were experiencing 50 years ago. And then if you go forward in 50 years in time, our climate system will continue to change. Because of those changes, we need to make sure that we're doing things to build more resilient communities, more resilient populations to reduce the impacts that it has on our health and the impacts that it has on our future generations' health as well. And when I talk about resilience, one of the things I'm really mentioning there is making sure that our healthcare systems and our public health systems are understanding the impacts of climate change so that we can do things to reduce impacts now and in the future. Simple things for uh, developing cities that, have, um, that are more walkable, uh, making sure that we understand which populations are being most impacted by extreme weather events and which areas are more vulnerable and trying to do things to reduce those impacts and reduce uh, the potential threats that they have to our health and to our society as a whole. I like that. We need to be the responsible adults and set the example because we know that this is happening. And, and Dr. Gold, I will ask uh, you to follow up with this in mind. The research that you do at UNMC, we know that those dollars will be well invested. So the return on that investment, like Dr. Jesse Bell is showing us tonight, it will be well worth it. Talk about why it's so important to have someone like Dr. Jesse Bell on your staff. Well, you know, what Dr. Bell does is representative of what great colleges of public health and what great universities do, which is to connect the dots. And what I mean by that is, uh, if, independent of your beliefs around what the causes of changes in the climate may be, it's indisputable that the climate is changing. And so being able to predict that, being able to understand what the impact of that is on human health, 
developing solutions to better uh, create resilience in our communities. And in the case of our audience tonight, uh, to help our farmers and ranchers continue to do what they're doing if climates continue to change. That's why people like Dr. Bell are so critical, and that's what great universities do. They try to give us a handle on being predictive of the future and creating strategies to make that future incredibly more successful. Uh, it's very exciting, and, you know, I, for one, am thrilled to have people like Dr. Bell with us. Well, I sure enjoy when you bring them along. And Dr. Bell, do you have any final thoughts for our viewers tonight? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm so excited about this because, you know, there's a lot of challenges that we face moving forward. But one of the things that I'm most excited about is that there's a lot of opportunity for us to address these complex issues. And I, I look at the young people that I interact with, whether it's medical students or students within the College of Public Health. We have a lot of people that are really interested in engaging and trying to address these issues to make sure that we have safer communities now and safer communities in the future. And so, you know, collectively, we can all work together to make sure that we're doing things on a local level that could potentially have impacts on the broader uh, scale as well. Absolutely. Dr. Gold, final thoughts for us tonight? Yeah, just, of course, to thank Dr. Bell and thank you and thank all the members of our audience. And to remember to show some a little extra grace and gratitude uh, when you're next in the ER or seen by your local health care professional, just to say thank you and that how much you appreciate them, particularly on this special day. I love that. And, you know, we all have had somebody, maybe you go to the doctor's office and a nurse or somebody at the front desk takes extra care with you. Maybe it's that time to go ahead and make that call you wanted to on their behalf. Let their supervisor know that you appreciated the work that the time that they spent with you, the work that they do. Just extend your gratitude because we do not want our health professionals to burn out, especially across rural America. I want to thank everybody for joining us. We only have a few moments, and I want to take this time to give you our phone number. If we didn't get to your question tonight, we would love for you to leave us a recording on our hotline. The number is 855-776-6147. Now, this is going to be really easy for you to do. You call, find a nice, comfortable place. You can record your question. You don't have to worry about the pressures of being on live television. And then we will get that question answered answered for you right here on live television. And there are no questions that Dr. Gold will turn away. If you have any sort of question about the vaccine, about anything that's coming up in your rural community, health related, he will get you an answer. That number is 855-776-6147. And remember, you can catch Rural Health Matters every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern time right here on RFD TV. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Wishing you and your family a beautifully blessed evening.